Okay, so this is last, the last week of the series, God Has a Name. We've been talking about how God has a name and how God gets to define how God is and we don't. So we saw how God's name is Yahweh, which means I am who I am, which means he is consistent. He never, ever, ever changes his character. And his character is that he is compassionate and gracious. He feels and he acts. He is slow to anger. He is long-suffering. He is abounding in love and faithfulness, which means he has covenant love towards us and that he will never, ever, 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 ever let go. And today, uh, before we dive into that huge portion of that last thing, which starts from which starts from maintaining love to thousands all the way to third and fourth generation, which is pretty much half the board. Before we get into that, uh, just some things we need to reflect on. Uh, we need to reflect on what the rest of it means to us first. Okay? There's this phrase in the Bible which uh, goes like this. My people who are called by my name. Sounds familiar? God keeps using that about his people, the people of Israel. My people who are called by my name. That's the same thing that can be said about us today. God's people who are called by His name. We are the name carriers or the presence carriers of God. Which means the characteristics of God should be evident in our lives. And we need to take a moment and reflect on that. So if God is compassionate and gracious, how compassionate and gracious are we? If he is slow to anger, now this is just for you to think about. If he is slow to anger, how slow to anger are you? If he is abounding in love, how much do I love? And if he is faithful, how obedient am I in a long direction for a long period of time before I get tired? We are called to be witnesses of who Yahweh is and his character. And this is what we're supposed to be like. Because don't forget, Jesus said we are salt and light, which means we get to have influence on everybody we encounter. And this is how we have influence, by carrying the name of God with us. Just something to think about before we dive into that last passage. Uh, so let's just get into it. Uh, can we read that last part just once again, which starts from uh, maintaining love to thousands. Okay, let's start. Let's go. Maintaining love to thousands for the miss rebellion and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Okay, everybody remember the first time we read this verse together? Do you remember everyone cringing at that last part? Okay, let's all relax because we're all uncomfortable about this. And let's see what it actually uh, means. We're all wondering what's up with that and we're wondering how Yahweh can be compassionate and gracious and yet whoop kids for nothing they've done wrong. Right? Anyone who's completely, totally fine with this? Cool, great. We're all on the same page. Okay, uh, okay. so there's, there's some... Uh, bad good news and there's some good good news okay the bad good news the bad good news is that we don't get to decide what parts of scripture we take okay. our lord and savior and our teacher is jesus who took the scriptures very seriously so if we are to follow his example it means uh, we need to come under the authority of scriptures okay we can't skim through the bible and pull out the parts that we like and eject the parts that we hate we have to take it for what it is God, like we discussed in the beginning, God gets to define what good is and what bad is. What we do with it is we question it and we struggle with it. And we try finding out what's on God's heart when it comes to this. Okay, so that's the bad good news. The good good news is that what we just read about God is actually something really beautiful and true. Okay, uh, we have a lot to figure out today, so let's just start off with the part that it says, maintaining love to thousands. Now that word love, we heard about it last time. It's hesed, which is covenant love, faithful love, unfailing love. I'm hoping everybody remembers what covenant actually stands for. 
but the only difference here this time is we read that he's maintaining it and that word there is NTSR I have no idea how it's pronounced so I'm just gonna say NTSR and it means to protect or to guard okay. Yahweh is gonna protect his blessing over you he wants to bless you and he's gonna make sure you get it that's what it means he's maintaining that love to you it's the idea that he he makes sure that you get his hesed which is his covenant love okay but notice what it says maintaining love to not just you to thousands it's limitless he's gonna love thousands and thousands and next he says forgiving wickedness rebellion and sin okay. a lot of people think that forgiveness was something that Jesus introduced in the Bible as if Yahweh was angry throughout the Old Testament and then Jesus comes and says, oh, let's forgive people and so not the case at all because forgiveness has been in God's heart right from uh, day one and that word there for forgiveness it is N-A-S-A -A. NASA, NASA, I'm not sure but uh, it's used throughout the scriptures throughout the Old Testament and what it means is to lift up to carry and to take away does that sound familiar at all? Right? To lift up something heavy and to take it away. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's exactly what happens when we are forgiven. And we see what exactly Yahweh forgives. Wickedness, sin, rebellion. So let's just quickly look at what those three mean. Uh, Wickedness in Hebrew that is Avon or Avon or A-V-O-N. It means any kind of bad behavior ranging from road rage to murder and genocide. Any kind of bad behavior. Next word is rebellion. In Hebrew it is Pesha, P-E-S-H-A. It's a legal word which means to break the law. God has given us commands. Every time we break a command, we Pesha. We rebel, which is us saying, I'll do as I please, thank you very much. That is special. And the last thing we see is sin, which is hata, which is H-A-T-A. -A. It means to miss the mark. Yeah, it is a symbolic of all of us messing up. There is a mark that we need to hit. And when we miss it, it is sin. Okay? Now these three words, wickedness, rebellion, sin, summarize the entirety of human pollution it summarizes the fallen nature of mankind okay. uh, this is going to be quite difficult and uh, i really hope you all stay with me on this because some of you all may not be happy about what's the things that are going to be said okay. anyone everyone who has ever lived falls under these three categories there are no exceptions. No matter what you believe, there are absolutely no exceptions to this. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The okay, uh, question that comes in our minds is probably, what about the really good people who've never hurt anyone? What about the kind soul out there on the street helping people but just doesn't know about the grace of God or anything like that? Look at me. No exceptions. Everyone has missed the mark. Everyone has lived in wickedness, sin and rebellion. What about the person in a far, far, far away land that nobody has ever reached and uh, has never heard the gospel? What if he's lived a good life? And what if he's lived a perfect life and, you know, he's just been good throughout his, the entirety of his life. What about him? Is he forgiven? Absolutely. Definitely. But the Bible makes it clear, such a person does not exist. There is no one who's lived a perfect life. No exceptions. Everyone falls under one of, actually all of these three categories. Now this is a difficult thing for some of us to believe. But we really need to be uh, truthful about what happens here. Uh, because this is exactly what Jesus came to do. He came to take away 
sin when we were helpless to do anything. Okay? And we read right here that Yahweh is forgiving. And notice that it doesn't say Yahweh forgives. It says he is forgiving, which means it's his nature to forgive. He is constantly with a desire to come to you, to come to all of us and forgive, eagerly waiting to forgive. But there is a counterpoint to this nature of God. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. So let's try uh, and look at uh, what that means. Yahweh is forgiving, but he is also just. Sin, which leads to evil, must be taken care of. Uh, Yahweh is forgiving to the people who want and ask for forgiveness. There are a lot of people who do not want forgiveness. Okay. The idea that uh, some deny that they are sinful, the idea that the human mind is warped up and man is a fallen creature and there's something wrong with our soul just doesn't sit well with some people. They deny that they are sinful. One of the reasons people do not want forgiveness. Uh, Emmanuel has had this constant pain in the back and chest and some weird pains in weird parts of his body for a long time. And I, I know Merrill has been trying to push him to get a blood test done for a really long time. And when we found out, we tried doing that too. And this is, this is what Emmanuel always says. I don't want to do a blood test because I'm scared of what I'll find out. I'm, I'm, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> Let's just hope that we can push him to do it. But right here we see this is the same case with sin. There are so many, maybe among us or people out there, who just don't want to reflect and figure out that they are sinful and where they've messed up. Because it's so much easier to live in denial. I think uh, in the Gospel of John it says people lived in darkness because they hated the light. Because the light would uncover their darkness. There are people who do not want forgiveness. And then there are others who are aware that they are screwed up and aware that they have sinned but just don't care. Right? But if we refuse to admit that we are sinful, we just cannot receive Yahweh's forgiveness. You have to say yes to it. Because Yahweh does not show favoritism to any of these, any of us. Uh, he cannot look in sin and, at sin and say, uh, they didn't know, that's okay. Or he cannot look at sin and say, boys will be boys. He has to deal with it. Right? Because he is just. And remember, justice is a good thing. Because Yahweh's end goal is a world completely free from evil. Right? It's not about revenge. It's about healing and renewal. Which is why he is not rigid. Which is why when we repent, he responds. He nahams. And he showers mercy upon us. It is always relational. The judge will finally judge. And that's also because we crave for it. We know when there's something wrong, we want it to be fixed, right? And one day we will get it. Yahweh is forgiving. Yahweh is just. And then we read the last part of that verse, which is probably the most difficult thing to read in the past few weeks. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents. Again, everybody relax. It's not what it looks like at all. Okay, uh, how do I know that? Because just a few chapters later, Moses gives this command. Check this out. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Can we all smile now? Okay, but so if it's not what it looks like, what could it possibly mean? Uh, there are some layers to this text that we'll just try to unpack quickly. The first is that parents' sin have direct consequences on their children. Okay? So, for example, if I have children and I run a meth lab and I get arrested, who's going to suffer? My kids. They're probably going to be taken to, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know how things work in India, but an adoption center, streets, it, it just gets worse and worse for them. And even if they do get into a loving home, it's going to be years before they are healed and recovered from all the mess that's been caused. Parents get a divorce. It's the children who suffer. The sin of parents have direct consequence on the lives of their 
children. There's another layer to this text, which is that sin runs in the family. Sin, in a way, is genetic. The saying, like father, like son, it's a reality. Sin runs uh, in the family. Uh, okay, I'm not sure how many of y'all can relate to this, but have you ever looked at either your mom or your dad and seen them doing something that you did not like throughout many years and you've said, I will never be like that? Yeah. Guess what? You're going to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> Chances are that you'll be like that. You probably will because sin carries on. Uh, short-tempered parents give birth to short-tempered kids. Uh, addicted parents sometimes give birth to addicted kids. It's, it's a harsh reality that we do live with and because Yahweh is just, he continues to punish sin in every generation until it is wiped out. That's what this text means. It does not mean that if your father sinned, God will come and whoop you. It means that God will deal with your sin the same way he dealt with your father's sin. It means you having a particular sin in your life cannot be blamed on your father. You cannot say it's my father's fault. God will still deal with you the way he needs to deal with you. Right? Uh, he, because the end goal is a world free from evil. And just want to ask, how many of you all are freaked out by this? Okay, that, that, that's pretty good. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with you all being freaked out. Uh, but stay with me on this. Read the end of that sentence. It says, third and fourth generation. Now, this doesn't really hit you where it needs to hit you. But uh, again, the problem is with the English language. Okay? The word generation doesn't really exist in that text. So if you just put it in the English language because it makes more sense to us, how that really reads is maintaining, we can read it as maintaining love to thousands, but forgiving, uh, but, main, but punishing the children to the third and fourth generation. The actual way of reading it is maintaining love to thousands, punishing to the third and fourth. Do you get that? It's a scale. It's comparing thousands to third and fourth. Maintaining love to thousands, but punishing only to the third and fourth. It's a comparison of three and four with thousands. Does that make sense? Okay, picture a scale, a well-balanced scale. On one side is justice, and on the other side, is this huge rock of mercy. And it's not a balanced scale at all. Because mercy is much bigger than judgment in this case. If you think this sounds a little heretical, it's not. Because the Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment every time. Maintaining love to thousands, forgiving sin, I mean punishing sin to the third and fourth. Yahweh is just, Yahweh is merciful, and he's forgiving. And when mercy and justice meet and collide, mercy wins every time. Okay. Uh, let's just see how this uh, plays out in the Bible in a story. In Numbers 14, there's this place where Israel is in a messed up uh, uh, situation. They've come to the edge of the promised land, finally. The thing that they've been waiting for their whole lives. And they're about to enter the land and then they find out that the land is filled with Amalekites and giants and warriors and they are just terrified at this moment. Uh, they think what chance they have and they say we should go back to Egypt. We should assign a leader for ourselves and go back to Egypt. To Egypt! Where they were slaves, where they were tortured. And they're saying we can't face giants because we're scared. Uh, and what Aaron does is he tries getting them to calm down and, and uh, he says, just take a chill pill, let's just go in and see what happens. And they respond by saying, bro, we're going to kill you. Obviously, Aaron has to back out at this point. And it's not just kill. If you know how people killed people at that time, they take a stone and whack you till you're dead. Not a very pleasant way to die. So obviously, Aaron backs down. Uh, the Israelites' problem here is that they don't trust Yahweh to be faithful. In a way, that's what sin is at its root. It's us not trusting God. Hmm? Trusting, trusting. <laughs> uh, 
if we think back all the way to Genesis in the Garden of Eden, you'll know that uh, God says there are two, two trees, tree of life, do whatever you want, tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat it. And then the serpent comes to Eve and says, did God really say don't eat it? If you eat it, you will know what good and evil is. So Eve has a choice, trust God who has his best interest, her best interest at heart, or trust her feelings and this random reptile that has just spoken to her. And what does Eve do? But what do we do when we don't trust God? Sin at its root is in a way uh, not trusting God and believing that he has some weird ulterior motives that we just cannot believe in. Okay, uh, but in Numbers 14, the people of Israel rebel and uh, finally Yahweh is, has had it and he says to Moses, he says this, How long will these people treat me with contempt? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a great nation. Yahweh is telling Moses he'll restart the plan and will just, you know, scratch it all up and he'll take it back to square one and make a nation out of Moses. To which I would have said, yay, sounds like a good plan. Because these people are a little uh, annoying. But Moses has begun to take on the character of God. Moses has begun to be a name carrier of God. He knows Yahweh is slow to anger and forgiving wickedness, sin and rebellion. And so he tells God, he says to God, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. He's quoting the verse that he had heard himself back to God. And he says, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth. But in accordance with your great love, Forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. And Yahweh being Yahweh answers that prayer. He says, fine, I will forgive them. But the story isn't over there. Because Yahweh continues, Nevertheless, as surely as I live, not one of them will ever see the land I promised as an oath to their ancestors. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Your children will roam around here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. The people sin and their children suffer by wandering in the land. That's what that last line means. Uh, Years back, I got to volunteer with this group that would meet once a week and discuss on life issues and about medical stuff and all that. And I remember there was this uh, friend of mine who was interning as a doctor at St. John's and he would basically dealt with kids who'd gotten uh, infected because of their parents' sexual past and promiscuity and things like that. So the kids would come with weird things on them and things like that. And I remember him looking at all of us and saying this, uh, the day you start becoming a good parent is today. Because the choices we make as 20 year olds and 16 year olds and 17 year olds affect our children 20 years down the line. We start being good parents today. That's uh, in a way that's what the verse is referring to. The point of the story is this, Yahweh is forgiving. Sin has consequences. Yahweh forgives. Sin will still get to you with its consequences, not with guilt and shame necessarily, but with consequences. Okay, uh, sin always overpromises and destroys. And like we saw, even with Israel, you can be forgiven, but you may miss out on a blessing because of the consequences of sin. And it can affect your descendants too. None of us ever make plans to sin and yet uh, it does. Which means that we need to start taking sin way more seriously than we do. Because it is serious to God. We need to stop taking it lightly and my prayer here is that as you hear this, I'm hoping it's make, made some of your stomachs feel uneasy. And I'm really hoping that some of your hearts have become heavy hearing all this because that's the only healthy emotional response to sin, to the gravity of sin. God absolutely forgives. 
And we, most of us know how he forgives. He forgives us through Jesus. He forgives us through the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb who suffered in our place. Because we sin, the Lamb dies. The Lamb dies and we live in God's favor. Jesus is the answer to the dilemma of mercy and justice. We see all of this at the cross. Uh, and here's something important we need to remember because in spite of all the weird stuff we read in the Bible, none of us ever get the right to call God mean to any of this. Because yes, he does get angry, but he takes out the anger on himself. He went to the cross for us. He paid for our sins. Because at the cross, he absorbs our sin and just releases his life. We've just got to uh, wrap our mind about around what this means for us. Uh, that closing line of Exodus 6 to 7 is, it is both a hope and a warning. Uh, let's start with the bad good news first again. The warning is that Yahweh will deal with our sin one way or another. There is nothing you can hide from God. It is going to be found out either in this age or uh, when he returns. We may not take sin all that seriously, but he does. And he took it seriously to the point of death. Which means there's no way he's going to let us off the hook. Sin is dehumanizing. Every time we get into it, we become less human and less than what God intended for us to be. And most of the time, sin ends up being its own punishment. So for example, the punishment for uh, porn or sex in a way that's out of God's design, uh, whether it's before marriage or outside of marriage or whatever it is, the punishment of all of that is a warped mind and an inability to trust anyone, an inability to have, an inability to maybe see men and women as anything but objects. Or it can be uh, something that just hurts us deep in our soul. That's our punishment for it. The punishment for lying and cheating, you will definitely get caught. The punishment for gossip is that people stop trusting you. And you stop trusting people. And you live in paranoia. And if we keep on sinning, the worst thing Yahweh can do is let us be. Right? It is not a best case scenario for us not to get caught. It's the worst case scenario if we don't get caught. If we are not willing to repent. Because we cannot ever cannot pretend to be holy. We can never pretend to be godly. It just, it's just meaningless. If we've got a sin in our life, we need to confess. We need to take it seriously. And I know for a fact that some of us here have done that. We've had some really dark secrets and we've brought it, up and brought it out into the light and we've confessed it. But there's also the harsh reality that some of us do have dark, dark deep sins in our lives that we're not willing to bring into the light. So maybe we just think it's not a big deal, but to God it is. And it needs to come out. It needs to be taken to God. Because if we don't, uh, here's something to scare you. Hebrews says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Because Yahweh is terrifyingly good. And the Lord disciplines the one he loves, Hebrews continues. If he does not discipline you, it means you are not a legitimate child. Which is the scariest thing that I can imagine for us. Some people believe that God would never punish his children, but of course he would. He's a father. What kind of a good father would not discipline his children and want the best for them? Right? We need to get down on our knees and repent. And by repent, I don't mean feel guilty, feel bad, and just mope about. Repentance means taking the sin, sin straight to Jesus, letting it die on the cross with him, nailing it with the cross with him, and letting him absorb it and letting Jesus break its hold over us. And that's the good, good news, the hope. We can break free from sin, even sin that goes way back for generations, even generational curses, even generational sins. We get to break free from it. We get to change the trajectory of our family line. We get to do that because of Jesus and the power that he has. We don't have to repeat the sins of our grandparents and parents 
and what was said about our parents does not have to be true about us. With Jesus, pawn, lying, greed, pride, envy, cheating, whatever it is, it can be broken.